the history of Venezuela is really a history of government destruction of our economy. You see, people talk about how Venezuela was very rich in the past, and the apex of that was in the 1950s, when Venezuela was just about to become a democracy, but was still an authoritarian country, uh, but was not socialist at all. It was one of the freest uh, countries in the world in regards to, to the economy, right? Lower taxes, little regulation of the economy by the government. And so businesses were able to prosper. We had millions of immigrants from Latin America, from the Middle East and from Europe, including my own grandparents who came from, from Italy and Spain. And people without any education could succeed and live their American dream in Venezuela. That's what it was. Um, going from nothing to building a middle-class family. And my grandparents who didn't even have a, an elementary education, their children had a college education. That's how big the jump was in the second half of the 20th century and the growth. However, bad economic policies uh, gradually destroyed our country and eventually led to the election of an actual socialist that completely obliterated the the, 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 democ the democracy we had and, and the free, free market, relatively free market we had. So in, in the 1950s, after, after Venezuela obtained uh, its first democratic um, government, uh, everything was going well. But in the 1970s, when one of the, of the presidents of Venezuela nationalized oil, the government started growing at a tremendous pace. Uh, the excuse was that we wanted to redistribute resources. So the government took over the oil industry. The oil industry, of course, uh, fell out of date. Uh, production stopped increasing. Uh, the economy tanked. After that, inflation went up because government spending shut up even more than, than revenue from oil. And, and the country became really not, not as good as it was in the past. It was still a, a great place to live comparative to other co places in Latin America, but it was nothing like it was in the 1950s and 60s. However, everything came to a halt in 1988 when the Venezuelan people elected Hugo Chavez. Chavez wanted to root out corruption was his, you know, his goal, but he also wanted to bring a socialist revolution. He was a friend of Fidel Castro. He was a friend of all, Salvador Allende who, who died in the 70s. Um, he, was a, he was a friend of, of communism and he sold himself as the only one who could fix Venezuela's problems. He had attempted a coup in 1992 and failed. He was jailed after the coup, but he was pardoned later. It's actually a, a scarily similar story to what Hitler did in Germany. Attempted a coup, went to jail, and after he got released from jail, run for elections and win power. That's what Chavez did. And so when Chavez entered power, he, he, one of his first actions was, was to end our constitution, completely reform it. And I don't mean amend something, I don't mean a little change, I mean rewrite it. And the Supreme Court of Venezuela allowed that to happen, even though it was not really a legal thing to do. It was not a part of the amendment process. And that's where everything started going wrong, right? Chavez changed the constitution and extended the presidential term. Chavez started taking over land and private companies. And after he took over private companies, the, the economy went to, to the ground, right? And inflation started going up because he started increasing government spending to pay for welfare programs we didn't have the money for. And, and so the, the central bank just printed money to, to uh, pay for them. And so all these policies success, successively were implemented. And nobody saw just Venezuela going the way of Cuba, which John is going to tell you a lot more about later, later today. The big problem was that Venezuelans Never, Venezuela is a special case because Venezuelans never were changed from one day to the next. It was, it was not like Cuba where Fidel Castro came with a violent revolution and started nationalizing private property pretty much, uh, you know, the, the next few weeks. In Venezuela, it was company by company. It was government intervention by government intervention. It was election by election that Chavez destroyed our country. And that's why I think Venezuela is such an important case for the rest of the world to learn from. Because the rest of the world faces a choice of people who, like Hugo Chavez, want to destroy America, want to destroy Australia, want to destroy the United Kingdom, want to destroy Europe, Africa, Latin America, Asia. 
And these people are going to try to gain power democratically. The problem is that once they gain power democratically, they're not going to be thrown out democratically. They enter by the votes and they only go out with the bullets. And that's the, that's the big problem here. Um, Chavez, after he nationalized some properties, implemented price controls, uh, which led to shortages that I myself experienced. And so I had to go to the supermarket only twice uh, per week I was allowed, uh, on Mondays and Saturdays, based on my ID number. Uh, I had to do lines of hours. I had to put my fingerprint to know what was allowed to, to purchase. It's, it's a complete system of oppression. And it didn't happen from one day to the next. It happened gradually. And that's why we have to be very, very wary of socialist promises, because somebody's going to have to pay for them. And in Venezuela, we paid for it with our liberty. So I think that, you know, if John or, or Jose want, wants to, to pitch into, I don't want to monopolize the, the conversation either. Uh, and I'll be checking for your questions. So if any of you have questions, please also send them in the chat. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Daniel. Really, is a very incredible story. And um, yes, you've noticed we have a newcomer, um, Jose. So thank you for giving time for Jose as well. Um, I will, um, he is the president um, to the Peruvian Taxpayers Association. It's another Latin American country. Um, we're gonna have a great comparison and a great discussion here. And I will pass the floor on to John. Hello, um, let me, I do have a presentation. Let me go to share screen and get it started. And thank you first and foremost for this opportunity to talk with you about Cuba. Uh, this is Lessons from Latin America, Cuba's Admonition for the World. Um, are you seeing my presentation just to make sure that I have done this right? Uh, yes, it's working perfectly, thank you. Perfect, thank you. well, this is Cuba. It's about the size and length of California, has a population of 11 million people. Um, it has a long history that predates Castro and one of the most, uh, I'd actually argue, the most pro-Cuban families that should be identified with Cuba instead of the Castros are the Bacardis. Uh, unlike the Castros whose father fought for maintaining the Spanish imperial presence in Cuba, the Bacardis who established their rum business in February of 1862, uh, had two generations that participated in the wars of independence. Uh, Emilio Bacardi Moro um, was jailed twice by the Spaniards for his independence activities, and his son, Emilio Bacardi Ley, um, was actually a field officer for Antonio Maceo and was fighting on the front lines uh, with the Cuban Mambises. Uh, there were two wars of independence in Cuba, one that took place between 1868 and 1878 called the Ten Years' War that was particularly brutal and a second war that started off between 18, in 1895 and led to an American intervention in 1898 because the Spaniards were engaging in brutal crimes against humanity. They actually were setting up concentration camps and uh, huge numbers of Cubans were killed in those camps due to disease for the most part, but it was a grave uh, systemic human rights violation. Some Cubans describe it as a genocide and we're quite grateful for the Americans intervening when they did in 1898. In 1902, the Americans leave after helping uh, rebuild Cuba's infrastructure, which had been destroyed during those two wars of independence. And on May 20th, 1902, the Cuban Republic comes into existence. There is an asterisk uh, called the Platt Amendment that uh, gave the U.S. right to intervene in Cuban affairs, which stuck in the craw of Cuban nationalists, but that was gotten rid of in 1933. Uh, during this period, during this half century, there were 17 Cuban presidents. There was a democracy. It had its flaws. Unfortunately, in 1952, Fulgencio Batista, who had been elected president previously in 1940, came back, organized a coup, and overthrew the democratic order. This created the instability that allowed Fidel and Raul Castro uh, to um, seize power a short while later with the help of the United States, I might add. In March of 1958, uh, Fidel Castro's movement, the July 26 movement, uh, visited the US State Department and requested a arms blockade, an arms embargo on Fulgencio Batista, which the United States did carry out. 
and U.S. diplomats were pressuring Batista to leave uh, throughout 1958. I also want to talk about some of the successes of the Republic, which have been successfully covered up by the dictatorship. Two Cuban doctors were nominated for the Nobel Prize in Medicine. 1906, Carlos Finley for the discovery of the mosquito as a vector for yellow fever. Uh, Agustin Walfredo Castellanos, who in the 1930s was pioneering um, retrograde injection contrast materials to be able to uh, look inside the human heart and recognize birth defects to prevent heart failure. And this was something that he pioneered in the 1930s and decades later was nominated by Colombia and Ecuador respectively for the Nobel Peace Prize. Thanks to Fidel Castro, I got to know Dr. Castellanos because he was in exile in Miami and was a pediatrician dealing with kids in, in uh, poor neighborhoods there because he did not want to continue in a communist Cuba. Republican Cuba's public health care achievements. Um, between 1900 and 1959, Cuba led all Latin American countries at raising life expectancy and reducing infant mortality bet between that, those two periods. Comparatively, under the Castro revolution, uh, the regime came in fourth and fifth respectively in those indices. And again, um, you had a, a healthcare system in Cuba that was very strong with large numbers of physicians, pharmacies, drug manufacturers, and there was also wide access. Uh, Cuba also had a very strong labor movement in Republican Cuba. So there was a, there was a strong private sector, but also a very strong uh, public health sector as well. This has not held up presently. Cuba is known by health experts to be a country today that does not report its epidemics. Most recently, we had the case of Zika, which Cuba failed to report thousands of Zika cases in 2017. We learned about it later because of contact tracing from tourists that had gone to Cuba and contracted Zika. Uh, microcephaly is one of the consequences, uh, a birth defect that emerges from Zika. But there have also been um, cholera outbreaks uh, in 2012, a journalist, by the Calixto Martinez was uh, jailed for reporting on it and being the whistleblower in that case. Uh, in, in 1997, we had a dengue outbreak with a Dr. Desi Mendoza breaking the story and he was jailed and forcibly exiled from the country for his uh, whistleblowing in that case. Pre-Castro Cuba exported food to the world. Uh, this is similar to what happened with Russia and also China. Prior to the communist revolutions, net exporters of agricultural products under communism, all of them became net importers. And Cuba today is importing food from the United States to be able to feed its people. Uh, the private sector, Cuba ranked fifth in the hemisphere in per capita income, second in per capita ownership of automobiles and telephones, and first in the number of television sets per inhabitant. Uh, that street today is empty with many dilapidated buildings, what was once a vibrant and thriving uh, business community. Castro's description of this era. He described it as a republic that had a constitution, laws, freedoms, president, congress, courts, where everybody could assemble, associate, speak, had complete freedom, public opinion, respected, heeded, and all problems of common interest freely discussed, political parties, radio and television debates, forms of public meetings, a whole nation pulsating with enthusiasm, looking forward to the next elections. Fidel Castro, um, when Batista does his coup in 1952, this was within weeks or days of the next presidential elections, which he would not have won. And that's why he did what he did. A year later, July 26th of 1953, Fidel Castro assaults something called the Mancada Barracks, and it's a failure. And his men are either captured or killed. He's captured and put on trial. Now, although Cuba was a dictatorship, it still had many of the remnants of the democratic order that existed before that. There were still independent media, there were still plenty of radio stations, televisions, and independent courts. So he was able to uh, defend himself and have his defense published, History Will Absolve Me, and that's part of that, uh, of that defense. Now, he wasn't saying he was a communist at the time because communism was very unpopular in Cuba. The Cubans had associated the communists with Fulgencio Batista because Batista was a left-wing dictator. 
but when he had been president in 1940, he ran on a platform with the Communist Party, and he had members of the Communist Party in his cabinet. And some of those same members of his cabinet ended up with Fidel Castro after 1959. So what does Fidel Castro say? If we had paused to tell people that we were Marxist-Leninist while we were up on Pico Turquino, up in the Sierra Maestra, and not yet strong, it is possible that we would never have been able to descend to the plains. Now, many of the people that were up in those hills with Fidel Castro were not communist, like Uber Matos on the far right, a commandant of the revolution, the man who brought the weapons for Fidel Castro's movement, also believed that it was a democratic uh, revolution that was under, being undertaken to restore the old democratic order, as Fidel Castro had declared during his trial. He ended up spending over 20 years in prison. And Fidel Castro, quote here from 1964, which is profoundly Leninist. Lenin is known to have explained that truth was in service to class struggle. Anything that served the communist goal of a revolutionary overthrow of the existing system was moral and true. And Fidel Castro echoes that sentiment with this quote from 1964, where he says, I conceive the truth in terms of a just and noble end. And that is when the truth is truly true. If it does not serve a just, noble, and positive end, truth as an abstract cat entity, philosophical category, in my opinion, does not exist. The Castro regime back then was also not just interested in building communism in Cuba. They were interested in exporting it. In 1966, they organized the Tricontinental Conference in Havana, where they brought together more than 500 delegates of assorted guerrilla, insurgent, and terrorist groups from around the world uh, to coordinate efforts at revolutionary successes in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, che Guevara, uh, the Argentine who uh, met Castro in the mid-50s in Mexico and was uh, a key figure in their taking power in 1959 and consolidating it, was an advocate of arming and training members of the Black Panther Party in the United States and training them in urban guerrilla warfare. And here's his quote uh, delivered uh, to the Tricontinental in April of 67 in, the, in a publication of the importance of hatred and creating conditions for these revolutionaries to become uh, effective, violent, selective, and cold killing machines arguing that soldiers must be thus, a people without hatred cannot vanquish a brutal enemy. Needless to say, a lot of human rights atrocities are the result of this type of philosophy. And in the case of Latin America, there were serious consequences. May 8th of 1967, Venezuela was attacked. Uh, two small boats carrying uh, heavily armed fighters made landfall 100 miles east of Caracas. It was an all-night gun battle with the Venezuelan military. Nine guerrillas were dead, two captured, one had escaped. The goal was to spark an uprising by Venezuelan peasants to bring about a socialist revolution. What the Castro brothers failed to do by force in 1967, they succeeded at the ballot box with Hugo Chavez in 1999. And that's a newspaper article talking about this armed aggression of Cuba and Venezuela from the time. Favara is captured and executed in Bolivia in 1967. 1968, Fidel Castro, the, the communist revolution in Cuba began its uh, confiscation of major businesses between 1959 and 1961, they were all taken. Bacardi, um, which had a history, going back to the wars of independence, which I already mentioned, but Bacardi had consistently defended democracy in Cuba. Anytime a uh, president overstayed his welcome, in the case of Machado in the 1920s, or Batista in the 1950s, Bacardi sided with those forces seeking a democratic restoration. So Bacardi was one of those groups that was um, lobbying and pushing for Batista's ouster in the 50s. So Bacardi was one of the last companies to be expropriated in 1961, one of the large companies. But in 1968, everything remaining was taken over. Uh, all privately owned enterprises, family stores, restaurants, handicraft stores, service shops, street vendors. You couldn't even shine a shoe in Havana anymore because that would be considered a capitalist deviation. All of these were owned and managed by the state. Farmers markets were eliminated, self-employment banned. Um, again, the Cuban government was also doing things abroad. 
Black Panther plot, 1969, to bomb five Manhattan department stores. Uh, it was um, luckily broken up with an indictment of 21 members. Uh, members of the Cuban mission were expelled from the country for helping coordinate the effort to engage in these series of bombings of commercial establishments in New York City. Now, I want to focus very briefly in the um, human rights systematically violated since 1959. And R.J. Rummel, who has an incredible site called Democide of How Governments Kill Their Citizens, gives an estimate of 73,000 killed. It's a, me it's a conservative and median estimate that was made in 1987. So you can imagine the number has increased since then. But I want to play very briefly what goes on. This began in 1959. This is a revolutionary tribunal in Cuba. You can see the courtroom packed with folks in the back, the revolutionary uh, judges lecturing the defendant who's standing there. The defense attorneys were not defense attorneys per se because everyone is serving the interest of the government, the revolutionary government in this case. So they would normally get up and apologize for their client and ask for the mercy of the revolutionary court. And you can see various witnesses getting up to speak and address the court and the revolutionaries taking their notes. And this is a relatively quick process. And most of the time uh, they were found guilty. There was a case where some pilots were found not guilty. Fidel Castro became upset and the pilots were tried a second time and found guilty the second time. The presiding judge committed suicide, allegedly. This is the individual after he was being found guilty. He asked permission to uh, tell the uh, firing squad uh, to fire, has his last smoke, and goes to the pit, on the edge of the pit, and screams fire, and is killed. Firing squads in Cuba went on for years. Thousands were executed. Oops, let me not repeat this again. Let me go to the next. Um, into the 2000s, one of the last cases were these three gentlemen, Lorenzo Enrique Copeo Castillo, Barbaro Leodan, Sevilla Garcia, um, along with Jorge. They were guilty of trying to flee Cuba. They hijacked a ferry. No one was killed. Um, but they were captured, put on trial, and shot within nine days of the hijacking taking place. Now, it's not just extrajudicial, not just judicial executions, but there are also plenty of extrajudicial executions. This month uh, will mark the 26th anniversary of the Teresa de Marshall tugboat massacre. In this case, 37 men, women, and children were killed when they tried to flee aboard a tugboat that was being captained by one of their relatives, who was a tugboat captain, and they were attacked and sunk by government vessels on July 13th of 94. The Inter-American Commission of Human Rights has provided an extensive report on this case, but it's, it's one that I think important to mention. Uh, prisoners of conscience dying on hunger strikes, Orlando Zapata Tamayo, February 23rd, 2010. Seven years of being mistreated and tortured by the regime. His crime was to organize human rights teach-ins and to distribute copies of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a document which Republican Cuba in 1948 had been pioneers in not only helping to draft it, but also lobbying uh, for its passage at the UN, uh, at the United Nations, and also for the creation of the UN Human Rights Commission. Osvaldo Paya and Herold Cepero, uh, these are members of the Christian Liberation Movement. They organized uh, Osvaldo Paya, a petition drive called the Varela Project, which um, within the existing legal structures of the Castro regime, was a legal initiative. They gathered initially 11,020 signatures, 10,000 were needed to be able to petition the government for human rights reforms. The regime's response was to crack down on the movement. 75 of their, 75 people were rounded up and jailed. A good chunk of them were uh, folks that had participated in the petition drive for the Varela project or been key organizers of that drive. And 
on July 22nd of 2012, both of these men were killed. Harold Cepero, who had been a student at the time that the Varela Project was taking place in 2000, 2002, was expelled from his university for circulating copies of the Varela Project. And police violence in Cuba is an ongoing thing. We just had this case of Hansel Hernandez shot in the back by the police in Cuba in June 24th of 2020. Unlike the United States, though, in Cuba, you are not allowed to videotape the police without the permission of the police, and you're not allowed to upload anything onto digital platforms without the permission of the police officer. And it cannot be something that portrays the Cuban government in a negative light. If not, that is punishable by fines and prison. Right now, a young woman. Kaleli de la Mora Valle is in danger. Her life is in danger. She was jailed for her opposition activities. She's a member of the Patriotic Union of Cuba. She got into prison and somehow got a recording device to try to record the conditions in the prison. It's important to remember that in Cuba, the International Committee of the Red Cross has not been able to visit the Cuban prisons since 1989. Before that, that was a small period of time that they were allowed. Before that, they had not been allowed to visit Cuban prison since 1959. And by comparison, the United States, it's Guantanamo prison base that the world knows about. They know about it because the International Committee of the Red Cross has had over 100 visits since 2001, just to compare. But from 2001 to the present, zero visits to Cubans' prisons. So they're very concerned about images of what those conditions are like in the prison getting out. So by her recording those conditions and being discovered, they're threatening her with a longer prison term. They beat her up. She's been interned in a psychiatric facility. She's currently on a hunger strike. Um, there apparently have been a suicide attempt fearing her return to prison. She's just 27 years old. But I want to play a quick recording, her talking just before she went into prison in, we're talking, this was just June of this year. Thank you very much. This concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, John. And now we will move on to Jose. You gotta unmute yourself. Yes, I always forget it. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. So nice to see you. Uh, thank you to the Australian Taxpayers Association and all the organizations that have been behind this wonderful event. I want to show you just two slides and explain to you how are things going here in Peru. Um, a little bit before the, the COVID crisis, during the crisis, and now that we are somehow uh, resuming activities and restarting a lot of economic activities. Um, Peru is a, it's a wonderful country. If I wanna say something about its history, 
uh, we were a Spanish colony, a Spanish province for more than 300 years. In those times, our culture was fully enriched. Obviously, there was a lot of violence, a lot of natural uh, problems, as in any other colony in the world. And in 1821, 1824, officially, we became an independent republic. So we're going to celebrate our 200 years of independence next year, 2021. In the last 30 years, Peru grew a lot economically, thanks to free market. Thanks to the first basic free market reforms and public policies that we implemented during these 30 years. But being honest, also in the last 10 or maybe yeah, 10 years, our state has been growing a lot. Our bureaucracy has become more um, heavy. Um, and and our our businesses are having a lot of troubles we're having a lot of troubles troubles small medium companies large companies we all have a lot of troubles because our bureaucracy in our state is becoming really heavy this is because a lot of socialist and populist ideas are also becoming stronger and and we don't have strong institutions we have a country with a, with a big, big, big informality. And that was something I, I wanted to show you. Uh, do you see the slide? Yeah, it's everything okay? Okay, cool. So this is a, a grasp of two elements of our, of our country that in this moment are very important. On one side, we have healthcare, healthcare system, healthcare services. On the other side, we have economy. And look at this kind of pyramid. It's not a pyramid. It's an awful pyramid. It's a disastrous pyramid. We have a 96% of micro businesses, we call it that way, really, really small uh, businesses. And in this, in this sector, in this private, really small sector, we have 99% of informality. That means 90% of the 96% of our businesses are informal. They don't pay taxes. They don't have their workers, you know, with uh, social security and, and, and benefits. So we have a large informality here in Peru, a really, really huge informality. And then our small businesses, talking about the economy, again, uh, are mostly three, four percent of, of, of all of them. And large and medium businesses, businesses represent just 0.1 percent of the total of companies of businesses in Peru. The formal businesses in Peru are 3.4 million or com of companies. So that means that I mean, less than, less than 1,000 or 2,000 companies are paying 70% of the taxes of Peru, okay? So how could we um, strengthen, how could we build a social contract in a country in which just 1,000 companies pay the 70% of the bill? That's almost impossible. And this situation is perfectly reflected in the situation of our healthcare system. State health, I, I don't like to call it public health. Public health is every healthcare, private and state can give uh, a public service. Um, state health, should cover the 96% of our population. It's a really, really bad service. We have a lot of, uh, you know, lines, overtimes to, to, to make an appointment. We don't have end 
now getting into the in, into the topic um before the, the 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 covid crisis we had less than five intensive care units per i think 100,000 people so we were not prepared for this crisis because our state healthcare system was already really bad and our healthcare ministry and, and, and all the bureaucracy that is behind this healthcare system is syndicalized, you know, full of guilds and, 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 and a lot of workers that earn a lot of money, but they don't want to renew and they don't want to change the, the health care uh, processes and, 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 and uh, they don't want to uh, um, buy better medicines. They don't want to try, techno try technology, innovation. It's really, really sad. That was the situation in, in which we face the arrival of the COVID uh, pandemic. And um, if you see both sides of the of this kind of graphic is is almost obvious that we are a divided country. We are a really divided country in which the elite of, of, of our citizens is a really small one. Um, and then you have a large amount of people that is left behind. This is happening today, even though we have tried to implement a lot of basic free market uh, regulations and, and polit policies and principles. Free market is not enough. You need institutions. You need education. You need law enforcement. You need strong authorities. You need ethics. You need political parties. You need a social um, awareness of, of responsibility, of duties, uh, you know, commitment with, 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 with order, commitment with the law. And we as a country, we don't have that. Next year, in April, we're going to have elections, presidential elections. Our president right now um, is a president that in the last three years, he's not a socialist, he's not a communist, but he didn't like economy. He didn't like to do some reforms. The, the minimum ones, okay? He didn't like to, he didn't want to, of course, and he didn't. So he, he devoted him, himself to, to fight against the Congress. He closed the Congress last year. Our Congress, our, our congressmen and women, they were really, really uh, such a mess in the last three or four years. They passed incredible laws against people, against companies, small companies, against uh, against everything that could develop the, 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 the country, you know, <laughs> it was really, really harsh. Um, so when you see this situation that I have showed you, the, the next slide will, will, will make sense. This is the, um, I mean, this is the way Peru has faced COVID and the results. This funny graphic which shows is that even though we were a rich country because we have a lot of uh, savings as a, as a country, our national debt was really short, um, our macro you know, economy was really good, even though that was, was true, look at this graphic, our um, gross product will fall more than the average of Latin America, mostly, and we are having a rate of mortality because of COVID that is really high. We had the longest quarantine in South America, almost 90 days. And because of this bureaucracy, because of this populist state, because of these um, politicians that are so worried about their money and their, their power and not to, you know, to, to lose their position, the resuming the, the the process of resuming activities has been really slow a lot of processes a lot of tramits restaurants are not allowed to open formal restaurants but you know 70 or 75 percent of, of, of the restaurants that are informal they are already opening and, and spreading the virus all around you know so it's funny because the state rules the formal activity 
put a lot of pressure over the formal activity, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of regulation, a lot of taxes, but the 80% of the country do whatever they want. That is our situation. And politicians have, have learned to live with this, pressing the formal company for more taxes, you know, um, keeping them really, really all the time stressed, worried, because they know they can be, you know, like, scrutinized and, 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 uh, and, and intervened, and then leaving all these people, these informal, obviously poor and needy people because they need public services, but, but they have to make a living day by day, leaving all of them just to their, to their luck and using them when elections come. And I will finish with this quote of, a, of, a, of an economist, a proven economist that lives in, in the States. He just wrote and he say two or three weeks ago, a good one, and one of, uh, of, his, of his quotes was this, we live, talking about Peru, we live in a region in which poor are left behind, behind with no health, education, or safety, while rich and middle class can afford those services. With, with such a social contract, it was impossible to respond like Germany, South Korea, or Singapore. Socialists right now in Peru are happy. They are happy because they know next year it is really probably it is possible that our next president will be a socialist one because we have this great fracture, this great bleach, this great you know distance between the state and the people businesses also, big, large businesses, and the people, and this, this big distance between formal and informal uh, workers, businesses, and, and, and actors. So if you were, were expect, I, I know that, and, and that many people in the world, in, in the States and, and in Europe, they have the official news about Peru. And the official news about Peru is Peru is going good, Peru is, no. In the last 15 years, it was kind of a Peruvian miracle because of, 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 the, of the growth of the economy. And, and that was because we, we have a, a lot of minerals and, and mining activity that, that supported that, that growth of the economy in the last 20 years. But that was temporal. That was just like a, you know, like a, like a chance. But that chance is gone because all the world is right now in crisis. We're gonna have two more years of crisis. And my, my, my question, for, for myself, for my people here in Peru, and for you is, what do you think about it? We can have free market and we can mess it up. If we don't have institutions, if we don't have uh, education, if we don't spread free market ideas, not only to the economists and lawyers, but to the people you know, in the streets, to the young people, to, the, to this informal sector, that they need information. They need to know how things work in a country. And that rights, they have a cost. They're not, they're not free rights. Rights, they have a cost. And that is what we are trying to do little by little here in the Taxpayers Association here in Peru. It's a, a huge work we have to do with another also partners. But, uh, but yeah, but that is the situation right now here in Peru. And I hope you, you can share your, 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 your reflections also with us and, and, and thank you, Daniel and Joan, for your presentations. That I mean, we can we can say that that our region is is going through a really critical moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. I wanted to build on on something you said because I feel very identified with what happened in Venezuela before Chavez, and it's a pattern, right? It's that socialist policies build on themselves. But that also means that free market policies build on themselves as well. This is what I mean with this. Um, when you ruin a country economically and you create these kinds of disasters that you see with, um, by the way, Jose, if you can stop sharing your screen so that we stop seeing that. Um, uh, do you, do you, you, you have a problem with that? Sharing, can you stop sharing your, I think I can do it. Okay, I just did. Uh -huh. um, no worries. Okay. Um, so, because the, the economy is destroyed, then people want more welfare, people want more government help because they're poor. And so 
it builds on itself. And that's what happened in Venezuela in the 70s. We just wanted to ride on the oil boom and we ended up destroying our oil industry because the government has no profit incentives to maintain anything. So oil production went down. And when we did free market reforms in the 90s, it was too late and Chavez already got elected. Uh, and he walked everything back and he destroyed our economy even further. But that also means that if we implement good free market reforms and we reduce poverty, and yes, it's of course, to, to have a free market, we need rule of law, like Jose was saying. So we need a police that enforce, that you know, catches the criminals, right? On safety, it's a real economic cost. And Latin America is very familiar with high crime. And that's a huge problem for us. You know, Caracas, where I lived in Venezuela, is the city with the highest murder rate in the whole world. I mean, it's worse than living in Afghanistan. That's, that's how nuts it is. Um, so that's very important. And once we implement good policies, you can build on themselves and people will support them. Um, Bradley asked, election by election, uh, does that mean people are kind of complicit? How do we fight that? Well, Brad, I think that one, one very easy way to fight that is by speaking up. In Venezuela, we were told that Venezuela will never become like Cuba. Uh, that Venezuela is not an island. Venezuela has oil. Cuba is just, you know, an island without resources. Of course, they ha that happened to them, right? Um, but guess, guess what? Today, we're economically less free than Cuba, according to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, that's how bad things got. And so we need to tell people about it. Uh, you can't be afraid. In the United States, in Australia, in, in most of the developed world, you see universities basically indoctrinating students. I lived it myself. You know, I went to college here in the United States, in Indiana. And my college was not like an Ivy League place where everybody was leftist, right? It was actually a pretty moderate place. You know, I was very thankful to go to college where I went. And still, I got professors who told me, a Venezuelan, that sanctions were the reason Venezuela was, was destroyed, not, not the economic policy. A, an American college professor who has no idea, he's not even an economist, he's just an English professor. He thought he knew more than the Venezuelans and the economists. Um, so I just told him in front of the class and everybody and I debated him and, and that's what you need to do because other people are afraid to speak up so you can't be afraid to speak up. I'd like, I'd like to interject for a moment. I think that it's not only an issue of people being, there are some people who are complicit, but I think also when you have an economic uh, implosion that's taking place worldwide because of this pandemic, we also need to look back at the Great Depression in the 1930s. It gave rise to radical left-wing parties to be able to seize power and also uh, the Nazis able to seize power at that time as well. It was due in part to the economic collapse, the failure to apply the rule of law. And in the case of Germany, Weimar Germany, I think the problem there was that they put in speech codes, they had hate speech laws, they restricted freedom of speech. And rather than suppressing the Nazis, it made their ideas more exotic and popular because they were outlawed. So I think that the defense of freedom of speech, freedom of association, so those people can get those ugly ideas out in the public square where they can be rebutted is very important. I think also, as Danielle pointed out, in the case of Hugo Chavez, Hugo Chavez engaged in a coup d'etat against the democratic government of Venezuela. Fidel Castro engaged in a coup d'etat against the dictatorship of Fulgencio Batista. He was sentenced to 17 years in prison, but Batista decided to free him because he thought he was no longer a threat. I'm sorry, and in Venezuela, Batista, it's, it's incredible. Except that Batista was also one of the theories floated by uh, Carlos Alberto Montaner, a great uh, Cuban writer who I recommend his works if you come across. His theory was that Batista wanted Fidel Castro in the hills and did not crush him when he could have done it because he wanted to be able to justify expanding defense spending in Cuba so he could steal more from the defense budget. Mm -hmm. And that's why he allowed Fidel Castro to continue for years and years in the hills. I'm going to interject oh, here for half a second, if that's okay. Just a logistical thing. Uh, so our, we are out of time. However, what we're going to do is we'll open it up so that people can unmute themselves and can ask questions. Um, if you guys are willing to stay on a little longer. Um, all right. And so we'll have that for the next 30 minutes and you can have 
more of an open discussion. I think that this conversation is very much worth continuing. Um, thank you so much. Those were fascinating presentations, and very humbling presentations. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Thanks. Well, say Ignacio, I want to ask you. I've, I was, I had the opportunity to listen to uh, the Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto the other day, and mm -hmm. the idea that he has about uh, empowering uh, the poorest. I guess what what you were referring to, if I'm not misstating, micro uh, businesses or micro capitalists to be able to have titles, and with that being able to, I guess, get credit and assistance, so they can. Can you tell me a little more about that and how that may be a positive or negative or neutral impact on the Peruvian economy? Hernando's idea, idea is, is still wonderful, is still available and applicable. Problem is that what, what you need is to, to implement it as, as a public policy. Because right now, and, 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 and this was like 30 years ago when, when, when he and other guys also with him um, <clears throat> developed this, this uh, these principles of how empowering the informal and giving them titles and, and was giving them opportunities and capital so they can grow and they can just like, you know, be free to, 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 to make a living and, 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 and to innovate and, 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 and so, but, but um, not but. And what, what, what the state, what Peruvian state did in the 90s was to basically implement some of the ideas of Fernando de Soto. That is true. There was an agency in Peru uh, that was created just to title people, give titles. And it was a huge effort and, and also a really, really important uh, achievement. Problem was that once you have a title and once you have a property, you need to make it valuable in a system. You know, have a bank, have you know rules and regulation that can incite, you know motivate you to put that capital in risk. Because somehow, when you have this property or, or or this title, you have to use it, and using it means that you have to kind of trade it and move it. So what happened next that we lack a regulation and a set of rules. Mm -hmm. that uh, give the people the opportunity and, the, and you know, and the field and an open field to use that, that, that tile, that property as money, as capital, as a value. Uh, and we are on time. We are totally on time, uh, as I told you. But, but I am afraid that, that this, this trending of, of populism and, and, and hidden socialism that is running around South America could become stronger. That is my... my my worst fear right now, you know, but, uh, but yes, Arnaldo de Soto was a, was a champion of this, of this, um, um, of this mission of make up a, a, a free market principle becoming real in, in you know, in, in the life of, of people. Yeah. Um, Jose, um, somebody here asked, uh, Elise Huang, that why is Chile so unique where the free market flourished? And, well, I think that Chile is also unique in how they were able to implement them. Uh, it was basically imposed to them by force, <laughs> uh, by, by Pinochet, after a socialist uh, president was overthrown, who was, you know, Salvador Allende, a terrible guy who had the same excuses as Chavez and Maduro. Uh, it's all an economic war and sanctions and he just hy hyperinflation, just like Venezuela, poverty. It was just much quicker in Chile. Pinochet then implemented um, a lot of free market reforms. You know, he was a brutal dictator. I don't support him at all. But the fact of how they were implemented is that. And because it was implemented in a constitution and it was a strong constitution, they were able to keep it. And now Chile is one of the most prosperous countries in the, in the continent. Um, and I think that there are similarities to America, not in the way it was imposed, but of the strength of a constitution to keep your freedom. Uh, and I think that that's so important. Con countries that are, are unstable, that are left wing, that where freedoms are not protected, are countries where they can change the constitution like this. Uh, in fact, there's actually a, a huge correlation between the numbers of amendments or changes in a constitution and, and how unstable or, or economically mis miserable is a country. Uh, and even the length of the constitutions is related. 
So the American constitution and the constitutions of most free countries have been able to keep those freedoms. And that's very important also in how to keep a free nation. I just wanted yeah. to add to what Daniel just said about Chile, because I think that Pinochet's success in overthrowing Allende owes part of that successful overthrow to Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro did not believe in Demo the democratic election of Allende. So when Allende goes into power, Fidel Castro was financing and training guerrilla groups that were knocking over banks and engaging in terrorism. That was one of the factors that created anxiety in the military and also in substantial sectors of the Chilean uh, middle class and political class that permitted that, that coup against uh, Allende to take place. I don't think it would have happened or happened as easily without the input of the Cuban intelligence services and Fidel Castro into the country. And he learned you know, from it, obviously, later in Venezuela. <laughs> and, 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 you know, we, we, we shouldn't um, forget all the, all the Cuban people that, uh, that is still, and John, you, you, you cannot let me lie, they, they are still around South America working for some political parties and some nonprofit organizations. The uh, doctors. The one, one, the, yeah, that's that's kind of weird, and we and we watch it as you as if as if it was an elephant in you know like in 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 the dining room, and we don't and we can't do nothing. Uh, two months ago, eighty five Cuban doctors arrived to Peru, and they were supposed to be um, you know. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, how do you say it? Um, assignals, assigned, yeah, assigned mm -hmm. to some specific regions that had a lot of troubles with the COVID. Well, they went to mining regions. They were assigned to regions in Peru in which there, were, there are mining companies with mining projects in which COVID was not present, you know? <laughs> It was so crazy. So when people realized that, they were like, oh, what, what the hell, you know, like, what are these Cuban people doing here? And they are paying them like a lot of money, giving them like, you know, like, uh, food and, and, and housing and, and all this stuff. And two months later, we, are, we realized that, but they are already over there. So what, what we are doing, what we are doing is when people is asking the state, the government to do this to, to I mean, to check, to check where these, where these people live, you know? So we, we should, the, the way uh, Cuban Communist Party is working right now remain almost, maybe less stronger, but, but remain in the same way like in the 60s and the 70s. It's, it's, it's kind, of, kind of weird, kind of funny, yeah. So much more uh, sophisticated. I think Simon wants to ask us something. I do, I do. Thanks very much, uh, Danielle and Jose. Uh, John, we met in uh, Miami, I know. Uh, yes. in 2015, and I wanted to well, we, ask- We both, we, we didn't have such thick beards back then. <laughs> no, that's true. Uh, John, I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, you, you told us the story of uh, uh, Surly uh, Leon. Surly Avila Leon. Yeah. Uh, how is she? Have you got news of- of how she's going and and well she's uh, she's doing well uh danielle could tell you a little about her because he was hanging out with her and president trump uh a few months back when those things could still go on uh she's good. living she's living in miami and she's still engaging in activism she's she had gone back to cuba a couple of times for short periods of time um and she remains committed to the cause of a free cuba Terrific. That's good to hear. Has she gone back to Cuba since, since I, you know, in November? Because I, I don't think so. Because not, she's I don't believe, I don't believe so. Okay. I told her not to, I, you know, she was telling me I'm going to go and I'm like, silly, what are you doing? Just stay here. You know, we've um, all been telling her that. <laughs> <laughs> we've all been telling her that. Yes. Yeah. I well, remember her telling hello, me. Um, um, yeah. Oh, yes. Luciana? Luciana. Um, sorry, sorry. Um, okay, um, I'm Luciana, I'm from Bolivia, so um, I have a question in general. Uh, I think that something that happened in Latin America that was really problematic was about mercantilism. I think that what actually we had in Latin America wasn't liberalism at all. Even when we had all of the dictatorship, we have mercantilism or crony capitalism. So now the people um, have 
a lot of, I don't know, a lot of um, hate for uh, the right wing, for liberalism in general, because they believe that what we had was actually liberalism. So maybe that's the reason why now we have a lot of left wing populism in Latin America. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I 100% agree, Luciana. Um, you know, Venezuela, Colombia, you know, Brazil, Bolivia, they went through something in the 20th, like second half of the 20th century, which was a theory proposed by, by the CELAC, which is one of the regional organizations, uh, about import substitution, they called it. It became very popular, every government implemented it, and it's just a fancy name for protectionism. Tariffs, uh, thinking that that's gonna protect the local industry and it's not gonna destroy the economy. And the fact is that it doesn't work, right? Uh, tariffs just increase the cost to consumers and it creates inefficiencies. You know, Venezuela needs to be producing oil. Uh, Bolivia needs to pro be producing something else. There are different comparative advantages. It's, that's what it's called in economics, right? Um, America cannot be producing bananas, right? It has to import them from, from Central America and South America. It's just how the weather works. So it would be senseless to impose tariffs. And people, you know, have never experienced true free markets in most Latin American countries. I think Chile is an example where they have actually experienced it. And I'm worried now that I see all this movement of leftist protests in Chile, uh, of I mean, they were about to reform their whole constitution if it wasn't because COVID-19 hit and, and they had to delay the referendum. But I'm very worried about the future of Chile that until now has been basically a developed country. I mean, they even have Starbucks, which is, I know it's, it's something silly, but you know, there are things that don't exist in, in developing countries and there are things that exist in developed countries. And Chile is one of them. But I, I think also if you look at Chile, I think also look at Costa Rica in terms of the healthcare systems there. Those healthcare systems rival the United States. They are far and above superior to Cuba, but they don't get the good press that Cuba gets. What shocks me is I see American politicians uh, using Cuba as an example. I Frankly, I prefer the American healthcare system to the Cuban healthcare system, but the Costa Rican healthcare system may be better than the American system. The Chilean may be better than the American system. But the Cuban system is a disaster that they don't have health care for the average Cuban in terms of medicines, uh, in terms of if you're not politically committed to the regime, as uh, the case we were talking about, Soleil Avila Leon, uh, she was assaulted with a machete because she wanted to keep a school open. Children were being required to walk uh, several kilometers each day to and from school. She wanted to have a school reopen so they wouldn't have to be taking that odyssey. And for her troubles, she was nearly murdered. But then the doctors were informed by state security that they couldn't treat her properly. So some of those doctors with a conscience told this woman that if she wanted to walk again or to be able to even bend her knees again, she would have to do it outside of Cuba. That's the reality of the Cuban healthcare system. And we've had other cases of ladies in white, peaceful women who dissent, who promote human rights, um, being left to the mercies of the Cuban healthcare system where their health is irrevocably damaged. Or in the case of the founder of the movement, Laura Poyan, she died. And it was described by a Cuban doctor as purposeful medical neglect surrounded by Cuban state security. That is the Cuban healthcare system. And that's yeah, what American yeah. politicians want for, for American citizens? Yeah, just adding a short comment to Luciana's question is that, I mean, think tanks, Latin American liberal think tanks or organizations should fight also chronic capitalism. They should. Which by the way, with liberal, we mean actually libertarian. It's just that it's really different yeah. between English and Spanish. It's true. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, libertarian or liberal, classic liberal, think tanks should uh, fight against chronic capitalism in such a way that they fight against populism. Because there is no, I mean, there is no worst way to, to destroy free market principles, you know, with uh, like the chronic capitalism uh, actions and activities, because it's, it's like hurting yourself with your own disease. 
no? So we have a lot of problems here in Peru with that also. And, and, and because obviously companies and, and some, some businessmen, they want the, the, the things to stay the way they are. Daniel described it perfectly historically, and that remains, you know, like the, the, the protection of some companies, the protection of some national big companies, those things remain. And it's hard to, to deal and fight with that, but, but you have to do it if you want to be coherent and, 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 and solid in, in, your, in, in the way you want to you wanna develop your country. You know? Yeah, it's true. I just Jose, I'm hearing this, oh, sorry. I was just going to ask Jose, can you speak a little bit about what's going on in Peru with the Venezuelan refugees? Um, mm -hmm. For those who don't know, you know, Venezuela's destruction by socialism has caused the largest refugee crisis in the world outside of Syria and approaching Syria. And most of the refugees have gone to Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, and then in the rest of the world, right? Uh, even here in the US. But there are like a million, I understand, in Peru. And Peru is a country of about 32 million people. So this is a very high number. What's going on? Well, it was at the beginning, it was really hard to deal with this problem because naturally it was a, a refugee crisis and you had a lot of, of Venezuelan people coming to our country. But it was interesting to, 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 to observe that 70% of the people that arrived to Peru were um, educated people. Okay, it, it, it was people that had finished university that had finished college. So they came here to work as a taxi driver, as a seller, as a, as a waitress or waiter, but they were doctors, nurses, they were like, you know, economists, lawyers, it was really sad. What happened next, like in the second year, was that uh, my, my migration process continued on and most of these educated and well-formed uh, uh, workforce started flying to Chile and to Argentina. Okay. As a matter, as a matter of fact, and, and I was telling you because Peruvian regulation and Peruvian state and Peruvian, you know, like rules were not that good for even for Venezuela that were coming from Venezuela. Well, uh, people I, I, will always think what's better. <laughs> Yeah, the same happened in Bolivia as well. Um, I think that uh, because we had Evo Morales as a president, now we have another president for a couple of months more. Anyway, when we had Morales, uh, we had a lot of migration of people from Venezuela. And the problem is that they didn't like Bolivia as well because we are, we are a socialist country. So they came here and they were like, okay, I just want to go to Argentina as well because <laughs> Yeah. And they're gonna get a surprise. That's some bad news for you. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's not, why not, I came I mean, to the United States, Luciana, because I'm like, I'm not gonna deal with this. <laughs> hopefully, now, now, now in Peru we're in a third phase. Be, be, being honest, right now in Peru we are going through a third phase, if you want to call it somehow, and we have a lot of Venezuelan already, you know, established here culturally. We are almost, you know, the same family and. and and, and it, it, it has been a lot of uh, progress in how Venezuelan are, you know, getting engaged with the economy, with the people, with the families. Obviously, there are a lot of Peruvian Venezuelan couples and marriages and all this stuff. So, I mean, it's sad, sad for Venezuela. I'm sad for Venezuela, not for Peru, because migration is always good. Somehow, the result will always be good, because you, have, you, you bring diversity, you, you, you bring work, you bring effort. You bring money, you bring consume. The problem is yeah. in, in, in Venezuela. Yeah. 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 Some people don't understand that there's been a lot of, um, you know, xenophobia in Latin America. It's incredible what I've seen. You know, I have friends in Argentina, I have friends in Chile, I have friends in Peru, in Colombia, in Panama, all from Venezuela. People even from my own high school in Venezuela that are all over the continent. And, and it's, in, it's very interesting the phenomenon that you see uh, because. It's, it's so incredible how fast things change. Venezuela before received millions of people and now we send millions of people to other countries. It's very, very sad. You know, my grandparents had to go to Venezuela when they were 17 years old and now they had to go back to, to Spain. Uh, it's, 
it's sad having to, to migrate like that. And it's the history of humanity. And it's all because of terrible socialist policies, which is why it's so important. This is not just about a little bit thing or you're going to make a little less money next year. This is about your livelihood. This is about having to leave everything behind, your family, your friends. I, I live by myself. I don't have my family here, you know? I have to talk to them through Skype if I want to talk to them. That's how terrible the impact is. And I'm lucky, you know? I, I, don't ha I didn't have to walk thousands of miles uh, sh without shoes through, through the Andes Mountains, which is what Venezuelans are doing. Yeah. Uh, I just noticed there's a question from David Adamson, which I don't think we addressed. Once a socialist government takes hold, is it possible to starve it so it will collapse? Bitcoin and other untaxable options, what should be done once the government is already oppressive? I would, basic, I would basically argue if it's, a socially, if it's a social democratic country, then you could argue back in the 60s or 70s, uh, Sweden at some points had that characteristic. You just have elections and you're able to vote them out. The problem is when it's, a sham <laughs> socialist uh, democracy like what you have now in Venezuela, they're not going anywhere and they're not going anywhere in Cuba. And you can uh, starve them, but by starving them, you're just going to limit what damage they can do to other countries because they're trying to export. I think uh, Jose Ignacio was talking about the Cuban doctors. I think it's important to point out there's an excellent article in the New York Times that came out in March of 2019 about Cuban doctors in Venezuela. And it describes first off that everyone dressed in a doctor's outfit or in a healthcare worker's outfit is not a healthcare worker. Cuban doctors that defected were reporting how some of those people that were practicing medicine did not have a license to practice medicine, were secret police and had a different agenda. And they may have been killing patients, but that wasn't their primary goal. They're, what they're doing out in those mining areas is probably trying to infiltrate the mining unions, um, newspapers, and other publications and figure out how they can bring the wonderful uh, system that they have in Cuba and Venezuela to Peru. And they're, and they're working hard. And they do it because they believe in it ideologically and expanding their project. Same thing with Chile. We heard, um, I think it was uh, Daniel, if correct me if it was Diosdado Cabello, who talked about the Bolivarian breezes coming oh, yeah. to Chile, and Chile exploded in riots last year, which when I watch what's going on now in the United States, I immediately thought of Chile. The Americans view things, of course, through their own prism, that they're unique. And of course, in this case, because it involves race, which I would argue is the Achilles heel of the United States, and there is an obsession because of the history around race, justifiably, but they don't see the other outside actors that may be operating to manipulate trying to the situation. Of exactly. Just well, like in the case of the Chile, Black Panthers, like you said in your, in your presentation. Right. But in the case of Chile, it wasn't a racial issue. It was a fair increase in the metro. And you had dozens of metro stations destroyed. And in the U.S., we see the issue of police abuse, uh, demonstrations that explode around the country. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd say that once the, you have a, an oppressive government, you really have just two choices, and that is fight uh, to death or, or leave, basically, um, because that's the only way. Uh, as for just having an op a government that you know, is running the economy to the ground, in Latin America, traditionally, what people do to protect themselves from that is saving US dollars, not in the local currency, um, because inflation has been really the way they tax us, because as Jose said, most people are not um, are not in the tax base, right? They're informal workers. They don't pay taxes. So many governments, how they are actually just raising revenue is by printing money to pay for government spending. And that's a tax. It's an inflation tax. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only way to actually tax the people who are not paying literal taxes. Um, and so the way to protect yourself from that is to save in a foreign currency so that you don't lose purchasing power. That's what people did in Venezuela, in Argentina, in the world. Most, most U.S. dollars in, in, in cash are actually not in the United States. They're abroad for people like the Venezuelans, for people like the Argentinians who want to protect their purchasing power and savings. Bitcoin is another choice, right? Venezuelans are actually yeah. mining Bitcoin like, you know, at record rates. It's incredible. I was thinking about the good 
point about technology that is true that uh, if you want to if you want to if you want to leave governments without money digital currency and and all these new fintech market is really important i mean obviously government will try to regulate it and will try to 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 intervene it of course but uh, i think that technology and <clears throat> if it is free technology if it uh, enhance like the relations between private actor private sector citizenship it could be also uh, a wall against the, the the government and the politicians intervention yeah I, 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 it will it, we will see in the future if technology will free us or or, or it will like black mirror us you know <laughs> <laughs> I, think I think we're living black mirror these days <laughs> yeah uh, i mean guys, i i gotta i gotta i gotta leave um it was really great talking to you jose do you have a twitter account yeah yeah i can yes put it in, in, in uh yes i'm gonna it. resend or i had sent it at the beginning uh john's and i but i don't have yours it's like this that's it I put in the chat. It's J I B T E T A. My my last name. Perfect. It was very good to meet you in person, Daniel. Um, we are connected on Twitter. So. Yes. Um, me too. And I see um, that. I see, do I oh, follow sorry. you? You do. You followed me first, yeah. and I followed you back. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you found me. Um, I I'm seeing also a question from Jeremy M, which is sort of outside my wheelhouse. So maybe Jose Ignacio can answer this. Does microfinancing such as Kiva.org have a major effect on the economies given that it is very capitalistic in nature? Yeah, well, that, that, is, that is what we're talking about technology. I mean, the good thing about technology is that uh, it, it's, gonna, it's gonna create a lot of roots of money that somehow will be uh, even if they have to pay taxes or whatever, but but they will have they will bring more access to to entrepreneurships and 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 microfinance and and micro businesses. Here in Peru, we we have to deal with a situation that is hard because fifty fifty percent of our people uh, don't have internet access, and in some re that that is, that is the average. In some regions, is eighty percent of the families of the homes they don't have access to internet. So imagine that in, in, in this situation, we cannot talk about Kiva or FinTech or Bitcoin or digital currencies, but it's, it's a path we have, to, we have to go through. And yeah, these kind of solutions are important for, for our growth, obviously, yeah. I, I just wanted to, I wanted to return quickly to the topic of the Cuban doctors, because I, I mentioned the ones that aren't doctors, but there are many others who are doctors that are sent abroad and their condition, the UN Special Rapporteur on Trafficking uh, revealed in one of the reports that the situation that their, their treatment rises to the level of human trafficking and forced labor. And these governments are not paying the doctors, they're paying the Castro regime and the Castro regime in turn pays a very small percentage of doctors, in some cases 5%, in some cases up to 20% of the income goes to the doctors. And that's if they go back to Cuba. If not, even that can be taken away from them. So there are cases where there are doctors living abroad <clears throat> that don't have enough to eat and are in a very precarious situation. But they're making more money abroad than they would back in Cuba, where they have to moonlight in jobs in the informal economy to make ends meet. Same thing happens with teachers in, the, in, in that case, that they, they're sent abroad into Venezuela to indoctrinate, but they're getting more money uh, put aside back home than what they would be getting in Cuba, where there are cases where you see teachers that look physically emaciated in Cuba. The difference is yeah. that in, in relatively free societies in Latin America, free societies in the United States, you have an independent press, you have opposition parties which are able to denounce abuses in society. In the case of places like Cuba and Venezuela, or Nicaragua, we shouldn't uh, forget about Daniel Ortega and what he's been doing, those voices are silenced. In the case of Cuba, we have a gentleman, Roberto Quinones, who's a lawyer and a journalist. He's been in prison since September of this past year. He was beaten up in April because he tried to cover the trial of homeschoolers, a pair of ministers mm -hmm. who were homeschooling their kids who were jailed for it. And he covered their trial and was beaten up by the secret police and then put on trial himself for trying to report on that trial. He's in prison currently. We fear for his life as well.
and he's an Amnesty International prisoner of conscience. Oh, well, and, and, and yeah, and the other side of the of the coin is that, for example, talking about Australia, Emily, there's a lot of a lot of Peruvian flying and, and, and moving to Australia. I have friends in Perth, in I mean, in Sydney, and, and in many other cities of Australia working there. And once they had the chance, and I'm talking about middle class entrepreneurs, I mean, lawyers, economists, uh, they, they are choosing Australia, Canada, um, and some other specific countries to move and, and, and make a living there. So what that, talking about history, John, and you, you, you will know about this, when, you're, when your middle class and your leadership flies away from your country and move to another country that is a really really bad signal yeah. that's also because happening what? that's also happening with turks but i think yeah. perhaps for different reasons with erdogan's islamist regime a lot of the middle and upper class are fleeing to other countries the u.s that canada worst, et cetera. That, that is the worst that could happen because then you just leave in the country the people that would follow the politicians and that is, that is not prepared to challenge populism and socialism and all this authoritarianism. So, uh, yeah, so, I mean, South America and, and, and Latin America must be one of the, I mean, main concerns of free market movements in the world, I, I, I should say, because we were hoping South America and Latin America to flourish, you know, like a, a, as a new region of freedom and institutions and development. But that is not happening right now. We are going backwards. We're going backwards. I don't think that's just in Latin America, though. <laughs> well, yeah. It, yeah. Well, I think we take our freedoms for granted in countries like Australia. I see that all the time. Um, hmm. in, and the issues that we're fighting are obviously very different and not on the scale often, not on this scale that the you guys are facing in your countries. Um, but there's a huge disregard uh, for the freedoms that we have, I think. And people that do immigrate to Australia value it more, value just the simple stability and the ability to build your life up from the ground. They don't expect to be taken care of. They just have us feeling they're grateful for it. Well, exactly. thank you very much, guys. I, I have to go also, but Thank you for, for the opportunity. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so Good much for coming on. And I guess we'll thank close the us. Yeah, I'll close the Zoom chat after this. But thank you so much. This was a great discussion. Um, even the extra the whole discussion is good all the way through. So this is probably oh, the longest. A question there from Jennifer. Is the video going to be posted of this uh, session? Yes, it will be. Um, I'll get back to you. It'll be up on social media um, where it's at. I'm not 100% sure what those links are, but we'll email that out so I can find it. I also have uh, a question before everybody goes. Um, John, you talk about um, adoctrination in, in, in Cuba and in Venezuela, but I have a question about that. I think that's something that is happening in Latin America now is that um, a lot of countries are having a lot of public universities and even private universities that are fomenting this left-wing perspectives in education and everything uh, what what do you think about that i think it's not only in latin america it's also in the united states and we're seeing some of the fruits of it now i think that as freedom activists um, we have a duty to battle and to get differing voices to provide an alternative onto those campuses and to provide alternative reading lists to what's not being provided in the classroom and then obviously the other thing we need to do looking at the long term is to encourage liberty minded people uh, to go into the academy. I think that the problem is that if you're a libertarian or a capitalist, you want to be in the private sector, starting up your own business and setting up your own venture. And the idea of going through the academy where basically as a graduate student, you're a serf for a number of years living on next to nothing while you're doing your PhD. And then you have to jump through a number of hoops to eventually hopefully become a full professor is perhaps something not that attractive to a liberty-minded person. But we're seeing the results of not having those type of voices and thinkers in the academy and leaving it to the uh, Gramsci and Marxist and the uh, critical race theory folks that have bizarre ideas. I hope I yeah. answered your question. <laughs> yes, you did, thank you.
Oh, I think we will end it with that question. Uh, thank you so much, John, for staying on for so long. And thank you everyone else for joining. Um, this is a great session and we will post this video.